In the 921st hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala'an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah the Most High has forgiven my followers what they contemplate on within themselves as long as they do not act upon or speak about them. Mutafakun alayhi. In this hadith, <coughs> in Bukhari and Muslim, and this hadith uh, is a hadith which speaks about hadith and nafs. Hadith and nafs. And this is when a person has certain thoughts. Uh, perhaps it's, it's a waswas, it's a whispering of the shaitan about some issue that could be related to their religion and causing doubt. And this hadith of nafs, as we learn from this hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that it doesn't have a hukum unless, of course, you speak or you act upon those whisperings. And those whisperings, in general, they can come related to issues in, in aqidah, meaning creed, uh, related to tawheed, related to Allah Azza wa Jal, negative thoughts that are just strange thoughts that pass through the mind of a human being. This is the frailty of a human being. But as long as you don't speak or act upon those whispers, then there is no sin upon you. The relevance of this hadith being in this chapter, because we're in, of course, the book of marriage, and we're discussing... Uh, you know, the issues of, of talaq, divorce. And with that being the case, what is the relevance with hadith and nafs? We have to ask ourselves, what is the relevance of hadith and nafs? Of a hadith that speaks about hadith and nafs, you know, speaking uh, uh, subconscious thought or self-conscious thought or, or what have you. The relevance has to do with uh, the uh, of this hadith being in the in the hadith uh, amongst the hadith in the chapter of talaq, because hadith of nafs uh, sometimes it's just hadith of nafs in which causes a person to think about the issue of divorce. So then it has relevance in this chapter for that reason in that letting us know that if someone thinks about divorce, perhaps they're anger, angry with their spouse. Perhaps the, the, the spouse, there's, there's uh, discord, there's disharmony, or there's some fighting or some conflict or just an argument. And the, in the back of their mind, this thought comes to them. Not that it's something that they intend, not that it's something that they want to do at all, or act upon, but it's just something that passes through their mind because this is the comp the complexity of the human mind. And so that's why we have this hadith and nafs. Likewise, the whisperings, the waswas of the shaitan. And neither of those have a hukum and affect uh, the marital relationship as far as uh, divorce and talaq. Or... Uh, no, in, 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 in ending the marital bond. So in this hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, there are uh, immense benefits. And amongst those benefits, is that we learn that even if uh, a person has this thought often, that regardless of whether this is something that is a, a thought that passes through one's mind, or it is something which is often, the hukum is the same in that there is no talaq. It does not mean divorce. This is something that the shaitan, or the uh, due to the complexities of the mind, uh, that these types of whisperings and odd thoughts, strange thoughts, uh, happen due to this. So this waswas has no effect on uh, the hukum. 
And this is because the Prophet ﷺ said, Malam ta'bil o takallam. As long as you do not act, meaning act upon that waswas, that whispering, or takallam, speak. As long as you don't speak about it. So you don't, uh, from your tongue, say, you know, I want divorce. You know, it comes to your mind and you shoot it out of your mouth. Or you 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 act upon it. And, and this it can be in many of the uh, aspects of the religion, as we mentioned. It can be everything from Tawheed and Creed to other than that. Uh, also related to this hadith, is we find and we see that many people are afflicted by this waswas. Many people are afflicted by these whisperings, whispers of the shaitan, whispers, these internal uh, whisperings. And so that's why it's very important for us to understand this hadith and benefit from this hadith to let us know that it does not have an effect on your ibadah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ gave us a medicine for that by uh, you know reading the Mo'idatan the you know the Qul's Qul Hu Allahu Ahad and Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falaq Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas all kind of ways of dealing with this waswas or if it is an act of kufr amin tu billahi wa rasuli I believe in Allah and I believe in his messenger you know to, you know, so the Prophet ﷺ gave us uh, pro, uh, prophetic medicines in order to deal with this uh, this waswas. Related to this hadith, some of the fawaid or benefits of this hadith, the first benefit being it shows us the na'mah, the great na'mah, the great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has bestowed upon his ummah in that not holding them accountable for this waswas. And it shows us the perfection of Islam. That Islam does not hold you to accountable that which you have no control over. For example, this waswas. These whispers of the shaitan. They're obviously, they're whispers. They're external. They're internal, but they're also, they're out of your control. So, from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allows this. And from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not hold us accountable for that. This is our nature, our fitrah that He subhanahu wa ta'ala created. And another benefit of this hadith is that it shows us that no matter how serious this waswas or this hadith and nafs is, uh, for example, as we mentioned, dealing with issues of Tawheed and the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that a person is not held responsible for that. As long as they uh, do not persist in this and this is not a true part of their belief. And so that's very important for the person who's afflicted with waswas, especially with regards to Aqidah and Creed, is that they affirm they know whether they believe or not. They know if they're a hypocrite or not. And that the hypocrites, they don't believe internally. And they manifest Islam outwardly. And a lot of people, because of the waswas, they're tested by this, this, these uh, whisperings of the shaitan. They believe that in turn that they are hypocrites. Or that they are have left the fold of Islam. And this is a mistake and they should not hold their self liable like this. But rather, do not utter those things. Do not believe those things when it comes to Aqidah. Do not let the shaitan, the shaitan's going to whisper. Strange thoughts are going to come to your mind about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his lordship, about the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the qadr, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all kind of issues in Aqidah that will come, but... Do not submit yourself to those whimsical thoughts. And that's how you defeat the shaitan. 
and follow it up with acts of Iban in Ibada. And so if this is the case uh, with issues like uh, Tawheed, then of course this had the, and, and a person is not held responsible, meaning if they, they have these whisperings, <clears throat> then what about the one that of course that has this whispering of divorce and, and so forth? This, this of course, uh, this does not, uh, there's no hukum tied to that meaning that they, it has no effect on the person's marriage. This is not divorce. And very important, when those uh, things happen, then say, A'udhu billahi minashaitani minashaitani rajim. I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed shaitan. Seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this waswas. -was. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the point of reference we want to be concerned with uh, is when we make a statement when it comes to this waswas, -was, when it comes to this hadith and nefs. That when you have this these ill thoughts, for example, the thought of divorce or some other wicked thought, do not speak about it. Do not articulate it. Do not pronounce the divorce. Do not ask for the khula. Do not, uh, uh, you know, speak with this uh, these uh, a, a thought of kufr, of disbelief. And the way we learn that this is one of the criterion for it then becoming a sinful act or perhaps an act which becomes, uh, has a hukum tied to it is we know this because the Prophet ﷺ said, O takallam, or speak. Meaning that the person who speaks, that then they are now accountable because they spoke about this evil thought. They spoke about it. Not in, and this is one thing we want to distinguish, and this is not in the case someone who's asking maybe for advice, but they're not uttering, they're not saying that this is something that they believe or something like this, but they're asking for advice. What do you think about, I, I should do about this? Or asking a scholar or a person of knowledge. Uh, you know, I had this such and such thought in my mind. You know, asking for a hukum. No, this is not, this is, when they speak about it in this uh, way, this does not mean that now the person is divorced or now that they have done an act of kufr, but rather they are asking a hukum and they're giving a wasf, they're giving a description of that hadith of hadith nafs. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the other criterion for being held accountable for the hadith and nefs is that when a person, they act upon it. So the person makes an action, then, they, uh, then they're held accountable. And this is because of the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, what he said in the hadith. He said, and the shahid or the point of uh, that I want to mention in this hadith, which illustrates this hukum, uh, this and this benefit, is that the Prophet ﷺ, when he said, Malam Ta'mil, as long as they do not act, meaning act upon that waswas, act upon those whisperings of the shaitan. So in that case, meaning the opposite of that, if they act upon it, then now they're held accountable. So the person who then actualizes that uh, 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 act of disobedience, that sinfulness, they thought about zina, now they actually action, make action and, and commit zina, or strive to commit zina, then now they're held responsible for that. But the one, the shaitan whispered to them, and they uh, a, a sinful thought came in their mind, but they didn't act upon it, they're not held accountable. And so, and we already talked about how this is relevant to talaq, divorce. Another benefit of this hadith is 
that whenever when we hear uh, al qawl bin amal that when 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 uh when there is uh the term qawl or amal are mentioned and they're mentioned uh separately that when we hear Goal, meaning uh, to make a statement or saying that that includes uh, that or, or uh, when we make a, a statement and we talk about amal that amal includes the statement that means that for example in a hadith uh, if we hear a hadith and or uh, an ayat and it, it mentions about doing amal, doing good deeds or doing a deed, that statements are included in it unless they're mentioned separately or unless they're mentioned together. Okay? Unless they're mentioned together. Beca and this is because statements are actions of the tongue. Statements are actions of the tongue. So when we, when, as I'm speaking to you now, I'm uttering speech. My tongue is moving. Without a tongue, I wouldn't be able to articulate anything to you. So, t the the uh, so statements are a part, or are, are uh, statements and speaking is a part is included as a type of amal, as a type of deed. Okay, and so that's very important, and that's why the ulama they mention when they talk about iman, for example. And they say Iman is comprised of three parts or three components. Uh, and they mention, for example, Al-Qawl uh, bilisan, you know, statement of the tongue. Wa'amal bil-jawarih, and deeds of the limbs, you know, doing actions. And and Al-Amal bil qalb and actions of the heart. So all of those uh, parts, those components of Iman, in fact, have a, in, in, from one perspective, they are inclusive of actions. And that's why some of the ulama, they describe al-amal al qawm bi lisan, statement of the tongue, okay, the utterance, and this is, as we mentioned, the movement of the tongue, wal amal bi jawarih, you know, actions of the limbs, that the heart, we don't think of our heart usually as doing deeds. But when we talk about, for example, those internal acts of worship, like tawassal or tawakkal, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, having khawf uh, min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa raja, wa hope, and, 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 and khawf, and fear uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are actions of the heart. They are actions of the heart, that you're putting your heart into these acts of ibadah. It's not something physical, physically tangible, but they are actually an action. They describe it, the scholars they mention, that it's actually an action of the heart. So this, also this hadith shows us that uh, this uh, affirms for us that uh, that point. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Continuing on in our study of Bulugh Maram, the book of marriage, we reach the chapter of talaq in divorce, and we reach the 922nd hadith narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah the Most High has overlooked my followers' mistakes and forgetfulness. 
and what they are forced to do against their will. Reported by Ibn Majah and Al Hakam. Uh, Abu Hatim said that it is not an established authentic hadith. What we learn from the meaning of this hadith, if it is authenticated, some of the benefits of this hadith, first and foremost, is that this hadith illustrates for us the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith illustrates the mercy of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all merciful and that he subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and knows us better than we know ourselves so he knows our weaknesses and from some of our weaknesses are that we make mistakes and that we sin and we have forgetfulness as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta wa khayr al-khata'in atawabun. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, All the children of Adam, they sin. And the best of those who sin or transgress are those who repent. So letting us know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful and he's aware that we make mistakes and sins. And he created us in struggle. And with all of that being the case, he is still the most merciful and has mercy upon his slaves because he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms for us that the ruling is for Allah Azza wa Jal. The hukum, the ruling, is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the one who can overlook our faults and our mistakes, our sins. And He is the one who can pardon and, and forgive all sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily Allah does not forgive that you commit shirk with him. And this means the one who dies upon shirk, who dies upon kufr, who dies upon shirk. But he forgives other than that for whomsoever he wills. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives even the major sins, the one who commits adultery, the one who drinks alcohol, the one who beats women, the one who is abusive, the one who is an oppressor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability, subhanahu if he wishes, to forgive them. So these are major sins. And what Ahl Sunnah says is that the major sin is under the Mashia. They're tahta Mashiatillah. That they're under the mercy and the will of Allah. If he wills, he will pardon them. And if he wills, he will punish them in the hereafter. So this hadith affirms for us the mercy of Allah. What is the relevance of this hadith in this bab, in this chapter, in the chapter of Nikah, the book, uh, the uh, the chapter, the book of Nikah, and the chapter of divorce? What's the relevance? The relevance of that is that showing that sometimes a person can make a hukum like what, like divorce by mistake, or out of forgetfulness, okay, or what they do against their will that they are forced. So for example, someone could utter uh, divorce by mistake. They could say, you know, you know, something which maybe is close in its um, statement, a similar statement, which sounds like divorce, but it's not actually divorce. Or, and, or, in fact, they could mean to say something, and on the tip of their tongue, they slip and they utter divorce, that you're divorced. But they could have meant something totally different, or they could have had many things on their mind. It was a mistake. So this hadith illustrates for us 
that we're not held accountable. The Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the Rahmah of Allah, and this goes back to the hadith we already studied prior to this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgives those who, who make mistakes and those who, uh, 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 who are forced against their will. For example, if someone holds a gun to your head, which is an unlikely thing, a strange scenario, but it's possible. It's possible a jealous relative. It's possible a father wants to break up a marriage. He just doesn't like that individual. Maybe the father, father is not religious and the individual who's married to his daughter is religious. And the father detests that. And so he holds a gun to him. And he says, I'm going to kill you if you don't divorce my daughter. This would be ikra. This would be force. So if he uttered divorce under that situation in order to save his life, then the divorce would not take place. It would not be a divorce if that man did not really want to divorce his wife because it was under duress. And so those are just some of the scenarios in which uh, might fall under uh, that, that this hadith gives relevance to the chapter or the, the, the chapter of uh, divorce. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows that the one who divorces out of forgetfulness or out of ignorance or that they were forced, then their divorce is not considered. And this falls under the generality of this hadith because the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah the Most High has overlooked my, follow my followers' mistakes and forgetfulness and what they are forced to do against their will. So this is very general. This means all those things which fall under those various, uh, those various uh, uh, scenarios that the Prophet والسلام, has mentioned. In the next hadith, Narrated Ibn Abbas and if anyone makes his wife unlawful for himself, it is nothing. He said, Indeed, you have a good example in Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reported by Al Bukhari. Muslim has, when a man makes his wife unlawful for himself, it is treated uh, as an oath for which atonement must be made uh, if, if it's broken. Uh, this hadith, uh, an example of this hadith, this hadith uh, illustrates also for us the ruling regarding uh, if someone makes their uh, wife unlawful for them, meaning that they did this something and this is a mistaken hukum. This is something which is a mistake. So it means if a man says to his wife that he will not keep any relation uh, with her, and makes her unlawful for himself. It will not be regarded as a divorce. It is only a vow and has to be expiated. So in this scenario, it would be a vow that the man must expiate for that, for making that vow. Some of the uh, benefits of this hadith is one of the benefits is it shows that uh, if a man makes unlawful for himself his wife, then it is not, uh, uh, then, it, then it is not considered, she is not unlawful for him. She is not considered haram for him. But rather, he must expiate for making this vow because it is not, uh, it, it is not a, a valid uh, divorce. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it also illustrates for us that the origin for the believer is to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his actions and his statements sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al -kareem, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٍ حَسَنًا In Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And we have made for you 
in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, the best of examples. And in this hadith, in the last part of the hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said uh, that indeed you have a good example in Allah's Messenger. Uh, Ibn Abbas said, Ibn Abbas said, uh, uh, indeed you have a, a good example in Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this uh, shows us that the example of the Prophet sallallahu is the best of examples. And in relation to this hadith, that uh, this, the example of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he did not make this uh, this oath and these kind of attempt to make haram what is lawful for him haram. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So we have the best example in the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Uh, in another uh, another benefit of this hadith. that we learn from this hadith also that making a woman prohibited is like making something else prohibited uh, that is perfectly lawful that a person must uh, expiate. Those are just some of the main benefits that are derived from this hadith. In the next hadith, the 924th hadith, and before we go into this hadith, I want to mention a last point with regards to the prior hadith. If anyone makes his wife unlawful for himself, it is nothing. Uh, making one, uh, the, a husband making his wife unlawful, this is in the case of him not intending divorce and him saying a statement such as, you're haram for me, uh, or as we mentioned about, you know, that he's not going to have relations with her anymore and such and such and so forth. These kind of statements are not clear directly divorce. So it goes back to the intention of the man. And in those cases, as we mentioned, there will be an expiation, especially in the case uh, if it's like a vow. Uh, in this hadith, the 924th hadith narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when the daughter of Al Jaun or Al Jaun Al Jaun was admitted into the presence of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he went near her, she said, "I seek refuge in Allah from you." He replied, "You have sought refuge in the Supreme, the one who is worthy of refuge being taken in. Return to your family." Uh, reported by Al Bukhari. From this hadith, uh, this hadith has uh, immense benefits. And this woman, she chose not to be married to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she actually said she sought refuge from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was to her loss. Because if she had married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she would have been the, from the Ummahat al Mu'minin. So in the hereafter, in the dunya wal akhirah, she would have been uh, of those who are satisfied. However, for whatever reason, she sought refuge in Allah from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And from this hadith are many, many benefits. Some of the benefits of this hadith. One of the first benefits is that this hadith, <coughs> uh, that it shows and it illustrates that a person, uh, it's possible for a person to uh, prohibit themselves from goodness. And in this situation, by seeking refuge in a law, uh, this woman, she sought refuge in a law from the Prophet so here she did what? She prohibited herself from khair, from immense goodness, by uh, choosing and seeking refuge in Allah from the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So she prohibited herself from khair. 
Likewise, this can happen in many ways. And one of the ways in which people prohibit themselves from khair is by not being uh, vigilant in their worship and doing sunnahs or, or, or nawafil uh, prayers or prohibiting themselves when, when they're able to do so, meaning that they have the time and they're, they're not necessarily super busy, but they prohibit themselves from khair by choosing laziness. Uh, likewise, prohibiting oneself from seeking knowledge. Some people, for whatever reason, they prohibit themselves from seeking knowledge. And one of the ways in which I've witnessed personally, in which some people, they prohibit themselves from knowledge, is they listen to other people about studying in certain places or in certain institutions that they have the opportunity to study at. And they may not even have an alternative. But instead, because someone has warned against that institution, meaning it could be an institute for Arabic language, I've seen this countless times in Yemen, that people said, this institution is an institution of, you know, of bid'ah. Okay, and it's just a language institute. So instead of learning in that which they could have learned and perfected their Arabic, or at least come to a strong uh, level of Arabic, they prohibited themselves listening to the advice of so-and-so and so-and-so, and instead either didn't study or they ended up studying with someone who's not even a native speaker of the language and not even consistent in their teaching, in their lessons. So this is a way in which they prohibited themselves from khair. As the bent of Joan, uh, uh, she prohibited herself from khair by not marrying the message of Allah Sallam, and actually seeking refuge in Allah from the message of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the uh, very strong uh, love and exalting that the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, the way he exalted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, <clears throat> uh, constantly, of course, because that's how we learn how to pray, we learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we learn how to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the example of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, from his authentic sunnah. We learn the proper dua, we learned how to make dua from the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So he was the closest of mankind to Allah Azza wa Jal. And how do we see this example of ta'deem or the Prophet Sallallahu exalting Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in this hadith the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wa Salam said to the uh, to the woman he said لَقَدْ عُذْتِ بِعَظِيمٍ that you have sought refuge uh, with the exalted and this is talking about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that you have sought refuge in the exalted one, the most exalted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us uh, that this statement, that if a man says this statement, similar to what the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, El Hakibi Ahlik, you know, return to your family. Uh, and he has the intention to divorce, then this is considered divorce. Uh, and from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, how do we know this? Uh, aside from this hadith, which illustrates it uh, very clearly, we also know that, and this is an important principle in the religion and related to, uh, especially very important with regards to uh, pronouncing divorce, and that is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu the hadith of uh, Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala who said, سَمَعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ يَقُولُ إِنْ مَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَادِ Verily, actions are tied to the intentions. So, from that hadith, we see the importance of intention. And that, uh, the intention with regards to talaq. And this brings up the, another very, very important point. And that is the scholars, they divide uh, statements of talaq, of divorce, into two types. There is uh, talaq sarih, or a qul sarih, 
and a coal, uh, a, a kinaya. Kinaya meaning like a, uh, sort of like an analogy, making an analogy or a metaphor or uh, being uh, metaphorical in, in, in one's speech. So, for example, this hadith, the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, El Hakibi Ahlak, you know, return to your family, we say in Arabic that this is muhtamil. This statement is muhtamil, meaning it's it's kind of ambiguous, it's general, it's ambiguous. It could mean this and it could mean that. It could mean literally just return to your family, uh, and you know, and I'll see you later. Or it could mean I've divorced you. I, I have no need for you. Okay? So this a statement like this, we say is muhtamil. That it is, it is uh, kind of ambiguous. It's open to interpretation. And this is where the intention comes in. So if a man says a statement which is normally considered muhtamil, you know, he uses a kanaya like this, like return to your family, or I have no need of you, or uh, it's better that you leave. Like this, this can have many means. It could mean, you know, I just want you to leave the room. I'm, a I'm angry, or I, I want you to leave the house, okay, or whatever the case may be, uh, go shopping, or it could mean divorce, and so this returns back to what? It returns back to the intention, so the scholars mention that that is called what? It's called uh, a talaq, or a uh, al qawl kinaya, meaning it's, it's, it's metaphorical, or it, uh, it's uh, maybe, there's probably a better word for it. I can't think of what we call, what we say in English. But it means that it is, um, that it is a, st a statement which is open to more than one meaning. It could have a totally different meaning. Okay? It's not direct. And then the other type, as we mentioned, is sarih. And sarih, uh, a talaq sarih or a qul sarih, this is when uh, it's very clear. غير محتمل. That it, it, it's clear. Everyone knows it means divorce. For example, if a man, he says uh, to his wife, you're divorced. No one has a, a debate debate about what that means. Oh, maybe it means she should leave the house. Maybe she should go shopping. Maybe she should just go sit with her family. Maybe, no. No one has any, uh, it, it requires no clarification. It's sarih. It's clear. And so this uh, type of the, uh, talaq, uh, this type of statement, is the other type of statement that the ulama mentioned when they talk about uh, divorce, as far as the siga, as far as the statement, the statement of divorce, of pronouncing divorce. Uh, and again, it could be sari, very clear and open, or it could be a kinaya, where it is, uh, you know, it's ambiguous. So it's, you know, so then, then the, the judge, for example, if it was brought to a court, would uh, then look into the intention of the man and ask him to clarify, what's your intention? Was your intention divorce, or was your intention something else? And so if his intention was divorce, then the divorce took place. If his intention was other than that, then there is no divorce, because the statement is uh, not, uh, is ambiguous. Uh, another, uh, those are the main uh, benefits uh, of that hadith. In the next hadith, <clears throat> narrated uh, Jabir radiallahu ta'ala Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there is no divorce except after marriage and no freeing of a slave till one has possession of one reported by Abu Ya'la and Al-Hakam graded it as sahih or authentic but it is ma'lul meaning containing a hidden uh, defect uh, Ibn Majah reported a similar narration on the authority of of Al uh, Miswar Ibn Makhrama, uh, and its chain of narrators is uh, appears to be Hassan or good, but it is also Ma'lul and it has a hidden defect. <coughs> uh, in this hadith, uh, the hadith of uh, of Jabir radiallahu uh, anhu, what we learn from this hadith. Is uh, and, and the the topic of this hadith, the subject heading, you might say, of this hadith, is that if uh, the ruling regarding if one 
uh, pronounces divorce on someone who to someone who one is not married to. And so from this hadith, uh, a lot of the rulings are very clear. That first, uh, the first thing that we see uh, from this hadith is that uh, this hadith illustrates for us that a person that if a person of course is not married to someone they cannot pronounce a divorce on them okay you cannot divorce someone you do not you're not married to so that I think that's very clear and very op uh, very apparent from the meaning likewise if one does not own a slave then of course they cannot free the slave uh, and so this these are very uh, clear rulings uh, that are derived from this hadith. In the next hadith, the hadith of uh, in the uh, 926th hadith narrated Amr ibn Shu'ib on his father's authority from his grandfather, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, No descendant of Adam may make a vow concerning something he does not possess or set free a slave that he does not possess or divorce a woman whom he does not possess in marriage. Abu Dawood and at Tirmidhi reported it. The latter graded it as sound and transmitted it from Al-Bukhari. Uh, his statement that it is the most authentic hadith on this subject. So here's an authentic hadith illustrating the same ruling. This hadith from this hadith is the same ruling, meaning that someone, uh, if a person, of course, is not married to one, and even if, which seems to be something of common sense, uh, that they are unable to, uh, they cannot divorce someone they do not, uh, they're not married to. And likewise, freeing a slave in which a person does not possess. So the, the same benefits as we mentioned, only this hadith is a, uh, as uh, Bukhari mentioned, uh, that this is the most, uh, or Imam Tirmidhi graded it as Sahih and transmitted from Al Bukhari his statement. Imam Bukhari saying that this is the most sound hadith regarding this subject. In the next hadith, the 927th hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There are three people whose actions are not recorded. Uh, a sleeping person till he wakes, a child till he is grown up, and an insane person till he is restored to reason, meaning he gets his senses back, or recovers his senses. Reported by uh, Ahmed and Al-Arba, except the Tirmidhi, Al-Hakam graded it as Sahih or authentic. Uh, regarding the statement, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this uh Hadith in this narration, it mentions that he said, Hatta Yaqil O Yufik. So until he gains his 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 reason back, so meaning in this scenario, a person perhaps may have uh temporarily uh, uh temporarily perhaps uh lost consciousness or temporarily lost their intellect. Maybe they were confused for some reason or whatever, they got hit over the head and they were confused or they were exhausted and, and just, you know, their reason wasn't, you know, to get all together or they were exercising, whatever the case may be, you're due to sickness. So this is a, a fact of their intellect, intellectual capacity. The other thing, the Prophet ﷺ said, or recovers his senses. Uh, so in this case, this would be the scenario in which a person uh, perhaps is uh, has lost consciousness, a person who is prone to fainting, a person who has seizures, a person who was in a coma, and then they regained consciousness. So the Prophet ﷺ said, "Rufiya qalam an thalatha," that the pin is lifted off three. An naim, an naim hatta yistaykath on the person who uh, sleeps until he wakes up, 
وعن الصغير حتى يكبر and, and on the the child you know the pre uh, the pre pubescent uh, child until he becomes against uh, the age of puberty until he becomes pubescent and uh, and then the the last two the one who is uh, sane who regains regains their sanity or the one who is uh, their intellect they they lost consciousness and they regain their consciousness so in this authentic hadith we learn many many benefits and from amongst those benefits uh, first is from this hadith we see that uh, there is no punishment for the small child uh, that does uh, you know something muharram utters a statement of kufr uh, puts the Quran in the in water or whatever the case may be does something muharram that there is no punishment for them because the Prophet said that the pin is lifted off three letting us know that the person is not held responsible for that that doesn't mean you don't teach them that doesn't mean that you may not you may punish them you know as a as an adult as a parent to discipline them to for their tarbiyah for their education and for the educational effect but as a hukum shari they are not held responsible uh, and another benefit of this hadith that we also know that the for the small child that even if they swear or make a vow that they are not uh, held responsible as well. So this is another benefit of this hadith because the Prophet said Rufiya anhu aqalam and the Prophet mentioned that the pen is lifted upon this uh, person. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that it teaches us that if a young child uh, does something that would invalidate their hajj if they're on hajj of course there's no fidya for them <clears throat> and another benefit of this hadith also likewise if they left off the wajib during the hajj there's no fidya for them uh, the shahid or the main point of this hadith and benefit and relevancy for this uh, chapter the the chapter of divorce is that it shows that if there's a young child which has not reached puberty and they are married, you know, their parents have married them off very, very young, uh, that they are, that uh, divorce, uh, they're not responsible enough to pronounce divorce, okay? And this and with this point the scholars they mention uh, they have two statements some of the scholars say that <coughs> that uh, if a young child uh, that if a young child um, for example some of the Hanabila the, the Madhab of the Hanbali Madhab uh, that the divorce actually does take place even from an immature child if they have the intellectual capacity to understand uh, what divorce is and understand its meaning. So in that situation, a child with, that possesses that, then there would be, uh, then the divorce happens according to the Hanbali Metha. Another group of the ulama say no, they are not responsible and they uh, use the same evidence that the pin is lifted from the uh, from the child. A last uh, important benefit of this hadith is this is that all the things, all the issues which uh, someone who is ignorant of the hukum uh, is excused for and forgetfulness uh, for a person who's normally responsible, of course, min bab al ola, uh, in, in, uh, that this also, um, in the case of the young child, of course, also does not, 
they're excused for these things as well. So that's a last benefit of this hadith. 